trains, time travel, and the trek to Mars. So advances in transportation have always either enhanced commerce or created it or been pulled by it. And you can look all the way back to the Silk Road in China, the roads of the Roman Empire, on into the big ships and on in today. But transportation advances really drive our commerce. Now, in the age of exploration, the big ships were looking for a, a faster way to India. We're looking for a way to increase our commerce or decrease our speed in order to get things across. But there was one thing that really perplexed the seafarers of that day, and it was longitude. We didn't really know, they didn't know, how to measure longitude and how far they were going to the west. So it was for decades, it, it was just one of those things that we could do latitude because you can study the stars, but longitude escaped us. Time actually helped save that as well. When Harrison created the chronometer, a very special clock in order to measure time, it actually enhanced the way that we would go to seafarers and to travel to the west. Now, explorers will explore for two things, for gold and for glory. Gold will always outweigh glory. So when that drives that on into where do we need to go get the gold, you see that things will move forward. In, you know, when we have better cars, trucks, ships, trains, airplanes, rockets, even the Internet for moving information, transporting it from one place to the other. But I want to talk about a different era, and that is the train industry in the United States. 1825, no trains. In 1826, we started seeing in the orbit of the Northeast trains connecting population centers and industrial centers, bringing things to market, making that transportation market better. Then we started seeing a little bit more. Another orbit created in the Southeast, again, starting to connect things. By this time, we had over 50 private railroads. Now, they didn't like to share. They didn't like one railroad going on another railroad because that took away from their customer base. But eventually, that did happen. And we started seeing things moving into the Midwest. Then we started seeing the California expansion, the 1849 gold rush. We started seeing things, and the reason that we needed transportation to move things back and forth in, the, in the California. But they had another problem. Most everything that California needed was built or manufactured over here in the East. And it was shipped for six months around the, the, the coastline to get to California to deliver it. So there was a need. There was a need to connect the nation with the Transcontinental Railroad. Now, great things can happen when you have the technology that's capable, when you have the will to do it, and there was a will to do the Transcontinental Railroad. Lo decades of lobbying to connect the nations with a railroad. But then you have to have the way to fund it. Now, America in this time frame had a lot of country out here. Not a lot of people were settling that country. So the Congress said, okay, railroads, I will give you a tract of land for every mile that you build, but I want somebody to start over on the west and somebody to start over to the east, and then you're going to meet. And that's the way we ended up getting the Transcontinental Railroad. So by 1869, they met. And what happened is when the Jupiter engine met engine 119, we then had the time travel, the time machine that had just cut six months off of a journey, cut a journey from six months to two weeks. So that was the time machine that then started putting new technology into railroads. It started enhancing the people that were moving to the West. It brought in new entrepreneurs and it added a lot of value and, and actually looked at, across the nation at people who had never thought about going 2,500 miles now could. Just a few miles north of that in Promontory, just last week, we had uh, the new motor, the new freight train of America, and that is this, this rocket motor. This is a five-segment solid rocket motor that's going on the Space Launch System. We test-fired that. Uh, just uh, about, like I said, 10 miles north of where these guys met in 1869. 3.6 million pounds of thrust. It was quite a show. 
And it's even a better show when you have two of these 30 feet apart and four engines in between them. When we launch this thing in 18, it is going to be some more show. But what does all of this have to do with this? So, you know, we've explored the earth. <laughs> that goes to my graphics guy. <laughs> we've explored the moon with humans and with robots. We've explored Mars with robots. We haven't sent humans there yet. That is a long way, folks. That is at its closest, 34 million miles. That is a two-year journey to go there and come back with crew. But what can we learn? What can we learn from what Apollo did in the 60s? Now, it was more than Tang and Velcro and moon rocks. <laughs> we had to build fuel cells to power these devices. We had to have new alloys that were light enough and strong enough that had not been invented yet. We had to miniaturize computers. The computer in the lunar module that Neil Armstrong delivered or landed, this birthday card actually has more power than he had. <laughs> Two kilobytes in Snoopy here <laughs> is all Neil Armstrong had when he landed that thing on the moon. So what have we done today that we have benefited from then? from seeing those guys go to the moon and back. What are our new challenges and the technologies that are gonna be every day that we can learn from going to Mars? That's what we're looking into. And we have done great things in partnering with commerce. Commercial companies are now delivering cargo to the International Space Station. We're about to embark on commercial companies delivering crew to the International Space Station. But because NASA is enabling that to happen, it frees us up to go build this device to explore beyond the moon. The furthest that humans have ever been was on Apollo 13, or slingshotting around the moon to come back to save the crew at about 250,000 miles away from home. This vehicle is intended to go well beyond that, and that's what we're going to talk about here. But together, we can do things. Now, there will be some regulation. There will be some standardization, but that's okay. It actually is the balance that we're looking for that makes this the trick. When commerce is able to carry on, government should move to the next step and to conquer those things that are not commercially viable. That's the balance that we're looking for. It's not always easy for new entrants to make it in to any new endeavor. Henry Ford, when he tried to build cars, was shut out of the market because there was a proprietary standard and they wouldn't let him in. The railroads, with their proprietary nature, did not want new railroads to come in, but we overcame that. And we can overcome this. Space is a big place. There is room for us to work and to work together, and that's what we're going to do. Now, let's talk about time and, and transportation. Now, the railroads brought a lot of technological advances, but the thing that affects us all today is standardized time. Before you had cross-country railroads, you really had no reason to know what local time was in Chicago if you're in New York. But if you have a single track that goes from New York to Chicago, you better know what time it is in Chicago when you leave New York. So that standardization of time created time zones across America. It is now time zones across the world that have been adopted with time zero in Greenwich, England. You may have heard of Greenwich Mean Time, time zero. The measurement of those time zones across the world then go into, not only did it help our friends in the shipping business, but I would bet that some of you used your GPS to get here today, right? So the GPS is nothing more than a series of very smart chronometers, very smart clocks, very accurate clocks that triangulate your position and measure your time to their time to see where you are. That's what we found from the ships that have run into, uh, have uh, helped us in everyday life through the GPS system. So time continues to help us and also hurt us. Now, I, this is an orbit of, you see in the blue is the Earth, the red is Mars, 
These guys only coincide at their closest every 26 months. So that's when we have to launch to get there or a little bit ahead of that so we can make that trip. In space flight, we deal with extremes, with extreme temperatures, gravitational forces, with the extreme sizes of rockets and extreme distances. So I'm gonna do a little example to show you just how far these distances are. So if this is the Earth, how far is Mars? And I've got somebody who's gonna hold a Mars, but it's a Mars bar. <laughs> so let me, let me see if we can see this. Follow the red light to where Mars would be. Right up there. See that young man up there? So that's Mars. This is the Earth. So that looks like a long way. But let me show you how long that is. Here's the moon, the moon pie. <laughs> so there's Mars. This is the Earth. This is how close the moon is. That's as far as we've ever been. So this is the, the, the right distance and magnitude, but let me tell you about the size. If this was the right size of the planets, I would be holding up a Cheerio, and Clayton would be holding up half a Cheerio. So very large distances. Thank you, Clayton, you can eat the Mars bar. <laughs> this is our next freight train. This is called the Space Launch System. It's not about the altitude of where you go. I didn't show you where the space station was because it would be so close to that globe, I couldn't show you. The space station is only 212 miles or 220 miles up from the surface of the earth. It's about the distance of Birmingham to Nashville. It's not about the altitude, folks. It's about the energy that it takes. The space station is moving at 17,500 miles an hour. It's about the energy that it takes to get there. Sounding rockets and airplanes can get to the edge of space, but they can't orbit because they don't have the energy. But to get that energy, it takes massive amounts of propellant. And that's why our rockets are so big. The core stage of this vehicle has hydrogen and oxygen, and it's 212 feet tall and 30 feet in diameter. It's a great big rocket. It has four engines on the bottom, these two solid rocket motors, 3.6 million pounds of thrust apiece, just to get the Orion spacecraft up around the moon. It also has an upper stage that you can't see inside here. But everything that we take when we go to Mars has to come off the surface of the Earth, be put into space, and then move on to Mars. Now, there has been some studies that have looked at just how much does that take for that two-year journey. Around 400 tons is, is what we, we kind of approximate. This vehicle will carry 130 metric tons when we do the evolved capability, not this one, but the, the one that is gonna be built after this one. It'll, be, it'll evolve this vehicle from 70 metric tons to 130 metric tons, so at least four of those. It took 35 flights of the space shuttle to put the space station up. We don't have 35 flights worth of going to the moon or to Mars when it takes two years to get there and back. So we're building this big vehicle to do that. But whatever we build, the vehicle that goes to Mars may look a lot different than a rocket. The rocket will get it off of Earth, and then we build a station that can keep our crew safe while we go to Mars. But what are we going to do when we get there? How are we going to get there? I don't have the answers on what that spacecraft is going to look like. But what we are doing is we've got scientists, people in exploration like I am, and people in technology to look at how we advance technology in order to make this, this huge trip. We're looking at something called the proving ground. What can we go and do to understand more about the trip to Mars? There are a couple of moons of Mars. You may know them, Phobos and Deimos. Are we gonna land there? Are we gonna orbit Mars? Are we gonna land on Mars? Those are all questions that we're asking ourselves right now. What is the best first step? Well, let's consider one of them, landing on Phobos. What would that be like? So if an astronaut was standing on the moon Phobos, this is what his view would be of Mars. This moon is only 14 miles across, but it's only at 4,000 miles altitude from Mars. So when you look up, Mars is completely in your vision. 
That is a, a, of a significant advantage to us for a few reasons. For one, it's only about 25 degrees Fahrenheit in the sun, so that would be nice. It, um, it gives us a, a place to land on the, the moon without going into the gravity well that is Mars with having a, a large rocket to land and a large rocket to lift off. So maybe that's our first step. And it has a little bit of gravity, but I wanna show you what little bit of gravity it has. It actually, if I were standing on Phobos, I would weigh about three ounces. This hammer dropped here on Earth would drop slower than this feather. So having some gravity is pretty good because I know where it, it landed. It, went, it landed somewhere, right? So having a little bit of gravity may be of some advantage to us something that we can do and make that our first step before we go to Mars and really make a difference in living there and habitating there. So what is our time machine? If it takes us two years, that's a long time. But here's an idea. What if we had a vehicle that orbited Mars and Earth continuously and never landed? We put it up into orbit, and that's what's showing here. You've got Earth in the blue, Mars and the red, you know, they only come close together every 26 months. But if we had a vehicle in the green that took off from here, went straight to Mars, takes about four to six months, and we had another one of these that was in a different orbit that was on its way back to Earth, and we go and jump on that, and we come back to Earth. That provides all of the living quarters, the habitation, the shielding, everything that we need for the trip out there, and all we have to put on it are the things that we need when we get to Mars. I don't know. It's an idea called the cycler. Buzz Aldrin has been working on this, a second man to land on the moon. But it's not about me and my peers. We're building the capability for this to be done. This is about building the capability so that folks that are in high school now or just entering high school are the ones that are going to land on Mars. They're going to look at the capability that we built today and see what they can do with it. That's what we're doing. I build rockets because I watch Neil Armstrong and Gene Cernan and John Young. What we do today is gonna to motivate our young people to go take this to the next step. That young man that was just standing up, I think he would like to do it. His mother is not very fond of it. <laughs> but we have to be thinking about more than the next news cycle, more than the next presidential election, we have to look at things that can go over generations of things that we can build together create the global community that can make all this happen. Folks, this is your, your space program. I get to talk about it. There are a lot of ways to follow us. Tell us what you like. Tell us your ideas. Tell us what you don't like. But tell us. Join us and help us explore and go to Mars. Thank you very much.